we're going to be talking to Carol Schuler. She will be live with us from uh, Alabama. And we will be talking about the travails of her husband, Roger. While we spend a good bit of time here at the Horn and among the many members of the Horn family commune talking about uh, the failures of the for-profit media, when the opportunity arises to do something about it, we like to do it. And by we, I mean all of us. Because it's the stories that we talk about here and the way that we help to spread them around and help them, as the saying goes, get legs, that makes the difference. And so, as we speak, an innocent man, Roger Schuler, has been incarcerated. He is a journalist. He is trained as a journalist. He is a practicing journalist. He is, I suppose you could say, it, well, no, I don't suppose he is an investigative journalist. He does journalism. And he does it in one of the hardest places to do it in the world. No, not Afghanistan, not Iran, not Russia. He does it in Alabama. And that it is incredibly difficult to do journalism in Alabama is proven by what Roger Schuler is going through even as we speak. Alabama is, well, you all know I, I spent the first 18 years of my life there. I'm not there anymore, obviously. And as a native-born Alabamian, I can tell you that it can, be str it, it can be strange, it can be backwards, it can also be wonderful. But the power structures in the state of Alabama are deep and deeply entrenched. And they do not like being challenged. With that in mind, uh, you, you may recall uh, some, of the, uh, some of the things going back many years now that we have covered here on the Horn. The escapades of a former attorney general down there by the name of Troy King. Um, the story of the family values, God-fearing, upstanding Christian Southern Baptist minister who was found dead of... Uh, autoerotic self-asphyxiation involving sex toys that were illegal to possess in the state of Alabama, not to mention two wetsuits. Um, there is... Uh, the, when you think about the content of what Dr. Bill O'Brien just spent the last two hours talking about, and you compare that with what goes on in Alabama... it becomes pretty clear that we are talking about two very different worlds. One in which the rule of law obtains, and one in which, for instance, um, a generation or more ago, a man stood in the university doorway at the state university and declared, segregation now, Segregation yesterday, segregation today, segregation forever. George Wallace, uh, on his attempt to keep people of color from being able to obtain an education at a public-funded university. Segregation. The civil rights. The Birmingham church bombing. The uh, bloody Sunday at the Edmund Pettus Bridge in Selma, Alabama. These are all of a piece. It goes back to secession. It goes back to before secession. And it continues unto this very day. And this very day, a journalist by the name of Roger Schuler has been jailed by a 
the self-important martinet of a circuit judge who has declared who has decided apparently that the law is meaningless and we will talk to, we will be talking to Carol Schuler about everything that happened to Roger um, in the last few days this is you know this there's a there's a big difference between bringing on an expert to talk about something and tell you what you ought to think about something as opposed to bringing on someone who is an actual witness to unfolding events this is the latter I think when you hear from Mrs. Schuler, you will be even understanding that we're talking about Alabama you will be shocked you will be horrified uh, and when you realize that some of the same players involved here go all the way back to the theft of the election the gubernatorial election from Don Siegelman it, the, the, the bigger picture will become much more apparent and then hopefully after we have had a conversation with Mrs. Schuler, we will have a conversation about how to deal with it what to do with it um, our, our friend uh, Matt Osborne who we talked to on the uh, on the phone the other night Monday night uh, has helped to arrange all of this and he has created a hashtag he's actually on his way to the Schuler residence right now where he is going to document and inventory uh, the, the, the scene where Mr. Schuler was assaulted and beaten by uniformed members of local law enforcement there uh, he's also delivering relief supplies because Mrs. Schuler um, is largely under siege. So supplies have been gathered up, and uh, Matt has is on his way to the house right now to deliver those supplies. He has created a hashtag on Twitter that you can follow if you wish. Um, the hashtag is Op Schuler, O P S H U L E R, Op Schuler. Roger Schuler at present is being kept in uh, in in well un, in incarcerate. He is presently incarcerated. Uh, he has had no bail hearing, no bond hearing. Habeas corpus apparently means absolutely nothing in the state of Alabama. The pleadings in the case are sealed, and so consequently there is a legal defense fund that has been um, created for Roger Schuler, the legal schnauzer. And if you go to osborneinc.com, you, uh, you can find information about that. So I think I think we're going to have rather an interesting uh, uh, an interesting evening, and hopefully it will be an activist evening. Because one of the failures, and there's been a lot of pontificating lately from certain corners about failures of the for-profit media, and yet no, it never any mention of the for-profit aspect because the person pontificating will be doing as much for-profiting as anybody at oh say the New York Times. Um, one of the one of the failures of the for-profit media, as far as my lights uh, are able to discern, lies in the fact that it is a it, it purports to be a cool recitation of the facts of a given incident or moment or event, without suggesting a remedy without suggesting action, without suggesting uh, means of righting wrongs. Uh, there, was a, there was a journalism outfit once upon a time who 
whose uh, or maybe maybe whose whose motto wasn't it something like uh, comforting the afflicted and afflicting the comfortable? Well, that doesn't obtain in today's for-profit media landscape. In today's for-profit media landscape, when you've got when you've got people who sit before television cameras and pull down millions of dollars a year, they're not going to tell you to get out of your seat and onto your feet and into the street. They're going to tell you to stay tuned. We'll be back right after this ad for Preparation H, which you badly need because you've been sitting on your ass watching us talk to you from the electric TV box for most of your life. We'll be back, right? So, as you know, uh, if you are a uh, if you are a longtime listener, we take the idea of conversation radio very seriously here. To say this, uh, to say that we do interviews is not entirely accurate, and to say that it is uh, that that it is deliberately structured to get out a particular angle is wholly inaccurate. The idea is to get at the essence of an event or an issue by means of that thing that apparently, supposedly, separates us from the rest of uh, the animal kingdom, that is human speech. And so now, at 15 minutes past the hour, it's uh, 15 after 6 here uh, in the Eastern Time Zone, it's 15 after 5 in the Central Time Zone, uh, we are joined by Carol Schuler calling from Alabama. Mrs. Schuler, are you with us? Yes, sir. Yes, I'm here. I thank you, first of all, very kindly for taking time to uh, have this conversation. Uh, I know that it is probably difficult under the circumstances with which you are dealing, but you you have my sincere thanks and that of the Horn family commune uh, for joining oh, thank us. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Uh, tell us, uh, just as a matter of background, tell us a little bit about uh, you and your husband's work at the uh, Legal Schnauzer blog. You are one of the most read legal blogs in the country, right? Yes, I believe it was rated uh, as in the top 50 independently uh, law blogs in the country uh, as of last year. I can't remember what the outfit was at Chicago that named that, but uh, Roger did a post about that. But, yeah, I think he was right. we were ranked 37. And then all the others were had uh, academic backing or with the law firms and all that. It was like I don't hardly think there was any that was just totally independent. Uh, uh, called it independent. Uh, they called them independent, but they really weren't that independent. He was one of the, he was about the only one of them truly independent ones. Uh, so how did uh, how did you, how did you come into this? Um, it's my understanding Roger has a journalism background. Yes, he did. He does. He uh, graduated in uh, in seventy eight from the uh, University of Missouri, Columbia, the journalism school there. And he worked for. He came here at, right after graduation and started working with the Birmingham Post Herald, the daily morning paper here, mm -hmm. and worked here for worked there for eleven years and. About that time, you know, we'd met and, and decided we were going to get married, and so we decided, he decided he wanted to have something a little bit more normal hours and whatnot, and so he, he got a, a job at, uh, at UAB in the publications uh, area in their office and, and stayed there a good 18, 19 years before he was cheated out of his job there in two, 2008. 2008. And, uh, and the legal schnauzer blog was born when? It was in the previous year, in 07, and our legal travails kind of started up in, uh, well, we got hit with a lawsuit in 2000, uh, but based on some neighbor problems, property-related things that had happened in the previous year in 99 and whatnot, and we got hit with a, a, a bogus, you know, lawsuit, and anyway, it just drained us of all sorts of funds, you know, hiring a lawyer, you know how it is when you get sued, you know, you have to, you don't know what, you know, like just have to find somebody to represent you. We didn't know anything right. at that time. Uh, so, uh, no, go ahead. But, no, no, I mean, and then so that's from 2000, it's sort of like that's when it sort of 
went on, and I think it ended up going to uh, an actual civil trial in 2004, a jury trial. And Roger was representing himself at that point because we'd gone through a couple lawyers. It was, it was kind of a mess. But, uh, yeah, that, that was in 2004 that happened. So, but it didn't. It, it obviously did not uh, in any way curtail uh, your and Roger's dedication to uh, to trying to expose graft and corruption inside the state of Alabama, which, uh, right. from where I stand, Carol, uh, is is pretty rich pickings. Um, yes, it is. It's very rich pickings. It's like we had no idea. We were like lambs to the slaughter or something. I don't know. It's like we're like most people. You know, you think, oh, I mean, you know, courts are good and they're all, you know we got you know due process and all the stuff <laughs> it's just that you thought that you know we have and you know the judges are you know all you know up and up and and uh we it was a rude awakening believe yeah all that stuff that you expect to exist when you get all warm and fuzzy at the fourth of july parade and exactly exactly the stuff they and teach in civics class about exactly that we're supposed to supposed to be, and because most people, uh, I bless them, you know, maybe never have any kind of feelings with uh, any kind of civil arena, civil courts and everything, and I hope they don't. <laughs> I wouldn't wish it on hardly anybody. I mean, you know, like, so we're just like, you know, just ordinary people and just had no dream, had any inkling that we would ever be involved in anything like this, and... Uh, but like I said, once we had that, uh, the civil trial occurred in '04, and anyway, we, we decided that you know we needed to let people know it's like a public service, like to let know that you know this can happen to you too, kind of thing. Sure. Um, uh, I mean, if it happened to us, it can happen to anybody. Uh, we um, so we just in '07 started the Legal Schnauzer blog to just you know write about our story plus the, the Don Siegelman story was going on, and Richard Scritchy and, and Paul Miner over in Mississippi, and just, you know, there were some other things locally, I mean, here in the state and also near nearby state that uh, were, you know, just right about as far as the, how warped and messed up the legal system was, and so, it, you know, it wasn't just about us, we were just trying to expose that. And, so that right, and, and going back to the, <laughs> going back to the Siegelman issue, of course, that that uh, that election victory was essentially stolen from Don Siegelman by virtue of some uh, just nasty, dirty, old-fashioned uh, electoral flim-flam uh, down in Baldwin County, Alabama, a place I'm absolutely. familiar with. It was absolutely. And and, uh, and uh, Roger and Roger wrote about it. He did. Probably more, I mean, more than anybody. I know there, you know, I mean, I, well, without question, he wrote about it more than anybody. Uh, and, you know, understood it better, uh, you know, and understood the law. Like I said, having to represent himself and strike a jury and all this. I mean, I think he discovered, I don't know, I mean, sometimes, you know, lawyers, they don't, you know, represent even their own clients. Um, like properly and everything, like you think they're supposed to be like, oh, you know, people watch, you know, Perry Mason and all that kind of yeah, stuff. Yeah, it ain't Matlock. Uh-uh. Yeah, I wish it was. Uh, and they, sure. I think, you know, I'm hopeful that there are, you know, maybe some, but, I mean, just so many aren't, you know. I mean, that's the bad thing, just our personal experience. I mean, I, I'm, you know, I'm not, like, you know, painting all of them with the same brush. I mean, I, I hold out hope, keeping hope alive that there are some, <laughs> well, at, at present, uh, you are. I, mean, I think. I think it goes without saying that at present, you are badly in need of a couple of good ones. Yeah, um, uh, yeah. So that's why I'm, whole, you know, really like keeping hope alive, big time, because we're badly in need of, you know, a couple of good, really good. Well, let's attorneys. let's go to let's go to sort of uh, the crux. Uh, well, at least a little background on the crux of the matter. Um, mm -hmm. Your husband, among other things, reported on allegations that and and for those who don't know or have been in the deep south uh one cannot get elected to office one cannot get elected dog catcher in a place like alabama without trumpeting one's uh christian family values oh, value values yes absolutely <laughs> and part of having upstanding god fear and christian family values is that uh, you, you you most assuredly have to despise the gay people, right? Oh yes, the gay yeah the gays or 
uh, you know, anybody liberals be unfaithful. Oh, liberals, of course, that goes without saying. And then, you know, anybody would dare to, you know, be unfaithful in any way, and or, or certainly anybody that would, you know, dare having, you know, I mean, consider having an abortion. That's just like, you know, just all the worst thing that you could possibly do. And just, you know, just saying I mean, all that that whole down the line, you know, the family values uh, stuff they spout. <laughs> so and, you know, if, they, if, if they if they're true about it, that's one thing. But I mean, I'm not saying it's good. You know, obviously talking against gays and stuff. But I mean, how you live your life is one thing. But I mean, but being hypocritical is that precisely. That's it's not. A, it's it's the hypocrisy, and that brings us to a former attorney general of the state of Alabama, um, by the name of um, Pryor. Is it? Yes, Bill Pryor. Bill Pryor. <laughs> Who was yeah? Who, who was a dedicated? Uh, I think I think the phrase back in the bad old days of two thousand one to two thousand nine was a loyal bushy. Yeah. Uh, yep. He was he was a loyal bushy in the um, uh, the onslaught against Don Siegelman among other people. Correct. Oh yeah. Mm-hmm, he was. And he really drove that home. Mm-hmm. Yes, he did. And and along the way, of course. Uh, he uh, he opined uh, about well he's reminiscent of a man who's running for governor right now in Virginia a man by the name of Ken Cuccinelli who among other things wants to manage other people's sex lives. Oh okay. And I, I mean you. you know it, <laughs> shake the tree one of them falls out right. <laughs> yes, yeah, tongue and cheek of course you know I can't stand that kind of people I mean you know it's like whose business is it anyway to like tell. Right, them. but Bill Bill Pryor uh, was not uh, was not at all. Um, a shrinking violet when it came to speaking out about his uh, uh, traditional family values and how Absolutely. gay people were going to. Uh, uh, well, I mean, we've heard all the rhetoric. Uh, oh, gay, yeah. uh, everything, exactly. everything, right down to causing exactly. earthquakes. Um, yes, you know, to blame for everything. Right, and, and just, he tried to cancel a Disney, a Disneyland or Disney World trip. I can't remember which one. That, that's the so one. Yeah, he was yeah. one of those. He was one of those. Uh, it, Bill Pryor was one of those weirdos who uh, protested against gay days at Disney gay World. Day. Is that it? Exactly. Exactly. Yes, absolutely. They had a um, had a uh, family vacation planned, and uh, and then but when he can't, we heard he was going to be gay day. Well, then oh my goodness, then they you know canceled it because it was just. You know, just so egregious. So, what will we tell the children? <laughs> exactly. What will we tell the children? The children. You know. And, so, uh, so in return for his loyalty, George W. Bush nominated uh, Bill Pryor to become a an article constitutional Article Three sitting federal district judge in the state of Alabama. Correct. Uh, I believe. I believe that's right. Yeah. Yeah. And um, and and so uh, he he is sitting on the federal bench at this point in time. Yes, he's a federal judge, mm-hmm. uh, and uh, he has influence. Actually, he has his uh, office. We, we we were thinking he had it all, his office over in Atlanta, you know. Uh, but it turns out he's got a, his his office here, right here in the federal courthouse downtown, where we've had Roger and I have had a couple of cases, and. Um, so, so he's got his finger in any number of pies, <laughs> you know, as far as the, you know, ramrodding or, you know, taking care of the Siegelman case and, uh, and how many different other people in federal court, you know, making making it happen the way the Republican machine wants it to, you know, be done. Right. He does. So there he sits on the federal bench, and somehow or another, and you can maybe explain this uh, better than I can, a certain photograph came to uh, the attention of your husband, Roger. It did. It did. Uh, we got wind of that and uh, and got uh, were able to track it down. The really reliable sources uh, where it was investigated it was actually investigated. I always thought Roger wrote about it in his law, but investigated by the ABI back in the nineties that he had. Uh, actually, that's when it appeared on the web on a website, Bad Puppy. Yeah, I love the name of that. that Badpuppies.com. 
I know, I do too. I had to suck away. Kind of like the bad puppy but... versus the legal schnauzer. You know, there's a. <laughs> yeah. Right. Um, <laughs> so this is. A, this it was is... a print magazine before that in the 80s. It was in a four color magazine, from what we understand. And we've talked with numerous people who have seen that actual four color magazine in the 80s. Where the, where and the this photograph in question was of um, upstanding, God fearing, family values cherishing, um, traditional marriage supporting. Gay days boycotting Bill Pryor, totally naked in a magazine advertising for gay sex. Do I have it right? Yeah, uh, yes. Yeah, you know, it was targeted for the gay audience, and he was he was definitely of age. He was in the, in college. He was kind of a young looking guy, but we definitely have it on good. He was in college. So, is so it safe to did. say that uh, your husband Roger ruffled a few feathers uh, by writing about this and by publishing the photo? Yeah, I think, I think that would be a safe, that would be safe to say. He most certainly did. And, and he yeah. and and would it also be safe to say that he published the photos in the interest of journal of of journalistic disclosure of unethical conduct? Right. I mean, exactly. I mean, there was nothing I mean, salacious exactly. or prurient about this. He was so actually do doing do? the job that the First Amendment charges the Fourth Estate was with doing. Exactly. I mean, because he. It was in the public's interest. I mean, they had a right to know that this judge that sits and takes, you know, is paid by the taxpayers and sits there, you know, with a federal, you know, lifetime appointment, uh, is just uh, is sitting there and he's got this in his background, which compromises him. I mean, when you have that kind of dirt, I mean, you know, I'm not, I mean, you know, hey, somebody wants to pose naked, I mean, that's their business, I mean, whatever, but I mean, but to turn around and then proceed to be, you know, just like conservative family values, hypocrite kind of thing. That's something else because it goes so contrary to what he, what he espouses, and so that makes him vulnerable to be manipulated by you know by the Republican Party to say, hey, we've got this, and you do what we say, and so he's he's just in a compromised position. And I'm telling what kind of harm he's inflicted on how many people, you know, in the courts. And and of course, there's always I can't disclosure. I have never been nominated to the federal bench. I suspect I never will be. But I can I can posit, uh, Carol, that when one is nominated to the federal bench, people ask questions like, um, prospective judge, are there any dirty pictures of you out there fully naked that may have showed up in um, gay sex trolling magazines in the 1980s? Yeah, yeah exactly. They ask that. They definitely ask those questions. And I have a, a pretty, you know, you know, like I said, we were trying to, like, nail down the uh, the information exactly of how he answered. But I think it's safe to say that he answered as a negative. That, oh, no. I mean, you know. <laughs> oh, no. I've got, I've got me, I got me some family values. I'd never. I know. <laughs> never. I don't have anything shady in my background. Nothing sleazy. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm just. Pure as the driven snow, and so you know. And so, in he, in the in the course of doing his uh, uh, his due diligence, Roger reached out to other sources who confirmed that that they they did in fact in good faith believe that that was Bill Pryor, correct? Oh yeah, absolutely, absolutely. And it wasn't just one oh. or two people, was it? No, no, it wasn't. We had multiple multiple sources. That, uh, in fact, I recall that uh, I recall a quote from Roger's writing where one source said. Oh my God, that's Bill Pryor. <laughs> yeah, he did say that, and the resemblance is rather striking. If you would, you know, you know, I mean, I know it's young. I mean, people it looks changed somewhat over a period of you know however many years, and we understand that. But uh, and you know, he's uh, face filled out a little bit and all that, and maybe his hair shot. But I mean, it's it's him. I mean, he has a um, eye condition, you know, that uh, is not that many people have. And that's obvious that that person has them. He's he, he's a dead ringer. I mean, you know. So yeah. so the, the the Bill Pryor story ran up a huge red flag inside the, uh, the 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 Republican power structure of Alabama. Is that safe to say? I would yes, that would most definitely be safe to say. And that got him really really stirred up. And it was after that, you know, I just this whole. Rob Raleigh thing. I mean, it was just it's so strange because we've been, you know, like you've been right. writing about the Rob Raleigh and Liberty Duke situation, you know, for a few months going back, you know, I don't know, earlier, I can't remember when they started with the 
spring or summer or something. But then, you know, then all of a sudden they, so they got the concern, I guess, mysteriously when the prior photo showed up. Right. And, and okay, so to back up so everybody can keep up with, uh, because you kind of need a program for this. Yeah, you do. Um, now, Rob, uh, the, the, the man who beat, uh, by virtue of the skullduggery in Baldwin County, beat uh, Don Siegelman to become governor of Alabama was a na man named Bob Riley. Have I got that right? It was indeed Bob Riley. And Bob Riley touted his Sunday school credentials and his upstanding Christian family values, uh, which would, which would, uh, one would presume, would include teaching one's children that once one has become um, um, bonded in, in holy matrimony, that one does not go out, as we would say here in the hills, a romping with somebody else's oh. wife. Exactly. Yeah. And exactly. so Bob Riley has a son named Rob Riley. And what now? He's being groomed for a run for Congress now. But what was he before that? Um, gosh. Well, I mean, Rob. Uh, like I said, he's a private attorney here in Birmingham. Yale educated, I believe. Oh yes, absolutely. And um, he, you know, you know, Roger. I guess there's more details about him than you know. I. I do, but I think that's probably, I don't know that he's ever really actually held public office, you know, but like I said, he's pretty But he honest. was active within the Republican Party of Alabama. He was very active in the Republican Party, and, you know, I think, you know, he definitely, you know, you, you know, it's not hard to imagine that he probably had aspirations to follow in his daddy's footsteps, you know, I mean, uh, and, uh, but like I said, he's been, he's a private attorney, and, uh, but we've gotten you know, pretty good authority, and there's, like, you know, out there that he's interested in this vacated seat of Spencer, oh, uh, let's see, um, gosh. Spencer Bacchus. Spencer, Spencer Bacchus, okay, all right. I get, another bastion of, con, another bastion oh, of yeah, glorious I conservatism. Are, I mean, good. I mean, it's, like, hard to, easy to get them mixed up. <laughs> Both of them, I mean, it's, like, you can tell the difference. Sure. Uh, but, um, yes, absolutely. He, so, that he was circulated that he was interested in it, so... I guess he got all a flutter that uh, this stuff had been written, even though it was totally true, but he didn't want it out there because that might look, you know, maybe bad. <laughs> and the stuff being written, the stuff in question being written uh, that was being published, uh, the, the journalism being done by your husband, Roger, was to the effect that, in fact, um, upstanding family values um, Rob. Republican Rob Riley uh, had been, and perhaps ongoing, in an ongoing uh -huh. affair, with a woman by the name of Liberty Duke, and we're not she's making that up. Well, and yes, this is not. She's not a stripper or a porn star. No, uh, uh. <laughs> she's a lobbyist. I know it's hard to believe. What kind? <laughs> what kind of lobbyist? Uh, gosh, it's not like it was Dolphin Island or something. I'm, uh, you know, like I said, Roger knows more about that. I can't remember exactly what kind of lobbyist, but I mean, I can't really imagine that she's remotely qualified. I mean, uh, she's, you know, actually not, but I mean, you kind of got that job with, um, you know, the Republican Party and Riley's help. Uh, you know, she's just, because, I mean, her, her previous things, were like, you know, she ran a daycare center, and, gosh, I can't remember what other kind of big, great credential, credential she had that would qualify for being a, a lobbyist. So uh, so your your husband writes about this, uh, salacious bit of Republican family values, mm -hmm. and uh, what did Rob Riley then do a do after uh, after your husband had published this story? Well, um, he like I said, it seems like well, I mean, we didn't you know, hear of anything for a while. Even you know, Roger certainly contacted him and gave him a chance to comment and and you know wanted to interview him and all this kind of stuff and. Um, but, you know, after he'd written about it for a while, he did the same, of course, with Liberty, too, and uh, he'd written about it for a while, I mean, we started to hear some rumblings that, you know, that he was going to sue us or something. We just, it was just through the grapevine. We didn't have anything official. But then starting in the last week of September, we started having these, uh, just sheriff's deputies showing up to a couple of times a day, two and you know, like they were like trying to bust a meth lab or something. I mean, at your home? At, 
at, at our home. They were like coming, you know. I mean, it was just bizarre. I mean, it scared us to death. We didn't. I mean, we had no idea it was anything civil. We had no idea it was any kind of. They were cause normally a civil service. They just come and knock on the door, and one guy, and they might come again, you know, the next week. I mean, it's it's not that. Like, but, but, uh, so anyway, they did this for a good week, you know, and we were like, thinking, oh, my God, they're going to try to get in here and see something or tear up stuff or uh, trumped up arrest charges or gosh knows what. And so uh, we were scared to answer the door the way they were acting so aggressive and everything. They uh, would, like, you know, practically pull on the grass and the driveway, you know, like all the SWAT, SWAT team or something. <laughs> and so... Uh, but then finally, he, you know, some guy came by himself on a Sunday, the, I think that was 29th, I believe, of September, and knocked on the door and didn't answer it. And so then we had to proceed to go to the library. And when we, went, we pulled into the parking place of the library, this guy, all of a sudden there's a sheriff's deputy car right behind us. And we thought, uh-oh, you know, he was going to maybe try to get our computer. That's what, you know, I figured. Anyway, it was, it was a trumped-up traffic. So he just said that Roger had rolled through a, a stop sign which she didn't in our neighborhood. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, you know, that, it was the left-hand turn. <laughs> We've lived here 20-something years. You know, we're, like, we're good drivers, but we certainly, don't, you know, I mean, we're like other people may low, roll through right-hand turns, but we don't, and certainly not through a left-hand turn. And he claimed he was located at a, at a specific spot in the neighborhood, and he could see it. And, well, we went back later and went where he said he was, and you cannot see the stop. You can't see that vantage point. You can't see it. You can't see if somebody came to a full stop or not. So, I mean, he's lying, okay? I mean, <laughs> but besides that, I mean, uh, he came back and said he was going to issue Roger a warning. And uh, so he did. He was back or seven. That's when he said, you know, claims you've been served. Well, you can't, when it, you know, you, you can't do that. You can't serve somebody, you know, like for a bogus traffic stop like that. I mean, he had to, what he had to do is, like, even if it was bogus, he had to, like, give it my stuff and then let us go on our way. You know, but he was detaining us, I, I forget. Um, so, he, so he claimed to have served civil process papers on you during a traffic stop? Yes, yes, right. I, I, if you can believe that. Yes. And that, you can't, that, you can't do that. <laughs> I mean, so that, uh, the, the, the papers themselves, then, if I understand correctly... Um, scheduled some sort of a hearing before a circuit judge. Yeah, I, I, yeah, we didn't really, you know, get word of that. We like so we threw him out the window, you know, because we like it was just so mad, you know, got angry and drove off and everything. And um, well, he almost arrested Roger. I mean, you know, he tried to do that, but anyway, um, you know, I was, you know, acting upset enough. I think he thought the guy thought better of it and everything and decided to let him go, but you know, he was claiming Roger was disturbing the peace or some such nonsense. So, but I mean, that wasn't the but that wasn't the, yeah, that wasn't the end of it. Yeah, that wasn't the end of it. we we threw the papers out. But uh, but that essentially from what we understand later there was a uh, um a tr- some kind of a hearing the following day. Now what what lawsuit I'm supposed to this was like you know, it would have been bad enough if he had, like, uh, stopped us on, on this <laughs> traffic stop, which you can't do, and served us with just the suit itself. But it, uh, in addition to the suit itself was, you know, temporary restraining order and preliminary injunction and, and, and whatnot, all this stuff that we had no idea about. We were not involved in it. We didn't have a chance to say or have our say. I mean, you can't do that with defamation and by law. And so, you know, but you're supposed to be able to get you know, to service. I mean, like I said, it would have been wrong if he'd just given us the suit itself and us having 30 days to respond. Because that's pretty much standard, I think, to have 30 days to respond. And that would have been bad enough. I mean, but to have a, a, this, a hearing the following day, uh-huh. I mean, sure. So, uh, that, uh, yeah, this is, because when I first when I first began reading about this, I thought there was some sort of divorce proceedings. And you know, divorce proceedings are often under seal because we don't want that stuff being uh, aired from you know from one corner of the state to the other. There's a there's a public policy involved with that that makes a little bit of sense. But no, this is this is just a straight up lawsuit against Roger. Yeah. Right. You know, defamation. And we know you know the old song: you can get anybody can sue anybody for anything. I mean, I mean they'll prevail, but I mean that's the way it's set up, and you should, everybody should have their 
due process and day in court. And you know, you, you have proper service, make sure that that's done, and then the the respondent, which would be us, or you know, the, you know, and uh, that uh, we would have the 30 days in order to either hire an attorney or represent ourselves or whatever we do to re- make a response. You know, basically to say we deny this or we object and we're asking for it to be dismissed or any other standard stuff. And a lot of times it's not granted and it goes through a little process. But, I mean, you you have that opportunity to respond to these allegations. And, of course, it's up to the person bringing the claim to prove it, to prove the case. I mean, not us. To, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. And uh, so, I mean, oh, and also we, we happened to notice on the paper, it, it was stamped uh, with a few, a few papers from hanging in our car, but it was this stamped in July. Now, okay. It's stamped, you know, that it was, I guess, uh, filed in July sometime. And then while we were, it was under seal since that time. It was the thing that was under seal. And so what was going on all that uh, during the, from then until the end of September, and then all of a sudden they got all a flutter <laughs> to have to try to serve us immediately. What were they doing? I mean, you know, if it was so important, why didn't he serve us in July? You know? Uh, I'm thinking it's probably it has to do with the prior photos, because conceivably, I mean that's one thing. But I don't, or either that, or yeah, you know, I, I don't know. I mean, what would make him sit on it, and what what would make him have it under seal? What would make him sit on it all that time? Who knows? Well, it, it certainly sounds like um, no small amount of legal uh, strategizing on the part of Mr. Riley. And uh, what's more, it's not even it's not even a regular sitting circuit judge who's hearing the case. Is that correct? That is correct. He was appointed by the uh, Alabama Supreme Court. He's retired. I don't know what rock they got this guy I'm under. Um, <laughs> What's his name? I don't know why. I mean, I, I Claude Nielsen. I uh, like no e on the end. A C L A U D, I believe. And then I think maybe it's middle initial, maybe D, and it's N E I L S O N, I believe. Okay. But, uh, I've never heard of him. I don't. I don't like that. He was. He was got appointed by the Alabama Supreme Court, and. Uh, I and mean, it's like, okay, that's weird. I mean, it, it, is there any? Is there any? You look at it, it's weird. Everything is weird. <laughs> is there anything, Carol, uh, to indicate why a special judge was brought in instead of the regular judge? Uh, yeah, that's that's a good question. I'm, not, I'm you know, one possibility is maybe you know, he's um, just a um, Riley, you know, person that's going to rubber stamp whatever Riley wants. Although I would think that the Shelby County judges would, too. I don't know what the issue is with that. I mean, you know, I'm sure they, they would go along with pretty much whatever Riley's wanted and be so Republican and everything. Uh, so I don't know why they dug him up. Um, he so kind of hard to reach and whatnot. I mean, we, yeah, I don't even have, you know, we have no, we don't really know where he's located, contact the phone number for his office, anything. So it's kind of. And even even uh, even another journalist couldn't go and look at the court file right now. Is that uh, is that correct? That's correct. It's still under seal, or even an attorney, because we've got you know one attorney that makes it nothing definite, but we're you know looking at trying to get some attorney you know uh, legal help, and uh, one is did talk with Roger for uh, a while on Monday afternoon, and proceeded to um, try to see about getting the court you know see the court file, and, and it was under seal. So even an attorney that we might try to hire can't access it. He had to get it from, get this, Rob Riley's law firm who is representing him. You know, it's Rob Riley's own firm that's representing him. And Rob so Riley's he, law firm has apparently done all the drafting on the court orders. Is that right? Yes, that's right. Although, I mean, we thought that was outrageous, and it is outrageous and shouldn't be done, but evidently we have since learned, believe it or not, that that's commonplace not just here but even out in california and other places so i mean that, that i mean it's, it's hard to believe how hard to wrap your head around that that he would draft like like say a contempt order or something like that and like we'd fill in the blank in a couple places and then the because he, he sent it to us and it was like oh, can you believe this rob Riley's like writing the orders for the judge and then sure enough a few days later the judge had filled it and signed off on it. i mean that's weird and should not be done but evidently that may be one thing that maybe technically was maybe not improper. I mean, you know, it, evidently it happened. But it was based on all this other stuff that was improper. I mean, it should have even, how can you be held in contempt for, say, a te- uh, an injunction or a restraining order or something when it, that can't even be done by law in a defamation case? 
so. And so, uh, just to just to continue the narrative of what has happened to your husband and you, um, the the traffic stop was not the end of it. Mm -hmm. um, tell us a little bit about what happened uh, in the last week. Oh, well, the last week, yeah. Um, well, let's see. Um, couple of, I guess it's a week ago tonight. I guess today is Wednesday, isn't it? Um, but uh, Roger, well, actually, the week before that, or Wednesday, the prior Wednesday, we had gone to file a motion to quash service, uh, and because we had a the, the Thursday, whatever that Thursday was, um, uh, Thursday before the twenty third. Uh, that uh, there was going to be a hearing. And so we did file a motion to quash service. You know, they should have put sort of a stay on the proceedings, you know, and, and we weren't, you know, didn't have to show up and that they should have, like, had a hearing on that motion to quash service. And they didn't, you know, but they should have because we got it in there, you know, timely and all that. But uh, they claimed they had the hearing, I guess, on, on Thursday. But so anyway... Um, we had not heard anything about it being denied, which you can't outright deny. You're supposed to have a, a hearing for the motion to quash. But Roger had gone to the library, work on the blog, and get a little bite to eat, and I was at home, and I was napping. And, and so from what I understand, Roger says um, that he was, had pulled into our, our driveway and pulled to go into the, into the garage and was raising it up with the, with the clicker, and it started to go up. And all of a sudden, I just flew this. The sheriff's car came flying at high speed down our driveway and almost hit our car or house or both. And then maybe shot, stopped, shot, stopped about it. like maybe a foot, foot a foot in, uh, 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 maybe stopped like about a foot in, uh, from the car. In fact, they hit it. And the guy said something goofy like, how's your day going or how are you or something goofy. And Roger says, well, uh, you almost hit my car. You know, it's kind of like, what, he said, what are you doing? Or what, are, you know, and by this time the door's up, the garage door had raised, and he, he proceeded to just pull on in the garage. And uh, next thing you know, I mean, this guy, I mean, this sheriff is just, you know, he is just like there inside our garage, inside our house. And um, and so Roger gets out of the car, and the guy sits him out, well, why don't you step outside? And Roger says, well, I don't. You step outside. Uh, you, uh, you know, this is my house, and I'm going inside. You know, you don't have any business being here. And so he proceeded to walk away from him toward, you know, to go around the uh, other part of the garage to go up the stairs. Well, uh, at, at that juncture, you know, he, as the, the guy had legitimate, well, he shouldn't have just come into the, our, our house. But, you know, he could have said something. No search warrant, right? That's what I'm saying, no search warrant. And he no. said, well, I... He could have said, well, actually, matter, matter of fact, Mr. Schumer, I do have a, a business to be here because you you're under arrest and he's your, and read him his rights or something. I did he present him Did he present him with an arrest warrant? No. He didn't present him with a, a search warrant, an arrest warrant. He didn't say you're under arrest. He didn't say there are charges against you. He didn't read him his, uh, None of that. said nothing. said nothing of those, about any of that. He showed, had no paper and showed him anything. So Roger's walking away, and he gets uh, about, you know, you know, several a few feet away and all of a sudden this guy grabs him and throws him up against some storage boxes that we had down there and it, he went flying the boxes went everywhere and, and let's uh, just to, just to fill in a quick blank how old is your husband uh, my husband is 56 I believe yeah 56 and uh, he was providing no he, he wasn't providing any resistance he wasn't running he you know, was, he was just trying to walk, you know, wasn't he? Because, he, you know, he didn't close the garage door. Because uh, I asked him, I said, did you think about closing the garage Although, you know, it probably would have been a good idea. To, I mean, if he reached in the car for the clicker or I guess he could have lowered it with a button. We have how you have a button on the side of the wall. But he didn't close it. He left it open. And I guess to give the guy an opportunity to leave because he said, you know, leave. <laughs> and, of course, the guy wasn't having any of that. He was there to, you know, beat Roger up. Hey, well, once, he, once he pushed him into these boxes and Roger was went, you know, playing those boxes went everywhere, he maced him in the face. Okay, he maced him. And then there was some, he was trying to, Roger was trying to get him off of him, you know, he was like, you know, just like, get off of me and everything. And, and then he like, sh you know, got shoved into our dog's 
our, our late dog's pen. We had down there like a fencing material, real heavy, pushed it back a couple of feet, and it was you know, a major scuffle. And, and then also then three other sheriff's deputies appeared. Uh, Rogers, I talked with Roger today. He said they must have been lying in wait. It was like four vehicles total. And and they must have been nearby waiting for him to pull in or us leave. I mean, maybe they weren't. I don't think sure if they were here, we were here or not. But their plan was to confront him, and uh, which they did. And then Roger said while he was being pummeled, uh, they heard uh, at least a couple of deputies up at our front door pounding on the front door, saying something about that wife or that that woman or the wife. Namely, you. <laughs> Yes, that meant me. They wanted to arrest me too, and I was I was asleep, heavy sleeper or whatever I guess. And I know upstairs, and I didn't hear any of this stuff. I said between six and six thirty, I think, in the afternoon, and and so um, they when I didn't you know answer the door or anything or arrived, then they proceeded to stick him you know in the sheriff's car and lowered the and turned out the light and lowered the a garage door and took him off. They threatened to break his arm. They said, I'm gonna come out and break that. I'm gonna have his arms or you know, breaking his arms. And and that it was like I said, still still you know, no reading of rights, no arrest I mean saying you're under arrest for these charges. Nothing. Nothing. And and so they take him down to Columbiana, which is about I don't know, probably maybe twenty five miles south of here or something. And so at 11.30, that's when I just got, I happened to wait. I didn't mean to sleep that late, but anyway, I was just, uh, you know, really exhausted. We under a lot of stress and had some tiring days recently, and so and not, I hadn't been sleeping good. So that's when I, um, I happened to wake up, and I thought, hmm, you know, what time is it? You know, I just didn't think, and it was like, oh, my gosh, well, it's Roger, you know. And when I realized how late it was, I thought, what? Where's Roger? He must be asleep on the sofa. I thought he must have just, like, dozed off and was taking a nap on the sofa. And he wasn't. <laughs> he wasn't anywhere in the house. How long was it before you found out where he was? Well, it was it was a little while. And in the meantime, I had a, you know, coronary. Because, you know, I, you know it startled me because I, I realized how late it was. I thought, you know, I didn't see him yet. What in the bed. wasn't rest of the bed. I didn't see him in our little den or office where we had a sofa taken a nap. And I saw, and I looked where he keeps his billfold. I didn't see his billfold because you know usually if he comes home and he's going to take an old man, he'll like take stuff out of his pocket. You know how guys will take the billfold out, oh sure, whatever. And so I didn't see his billfold, and my heart stopped. I thought, oh my god, it's eleven thirty, and I don't, I don't see his billfold. He's been in a car accident. You know that was my first thought. You know, and I come flying downstairs to the living room, whatever area, and. and and I didn't see him anywhere. I was like, Roger, Roger. You know, I didn't, I didn't see him. I thought, well, maybe he crashed. I thought, well, okay, calm down. You know, maybe he crashed and the Bill Bill was just laying on the coffee table or something. No, he wasn't anywhere to be seen. So I thought, oh, Lord. So I went running down to the garage thinking, uh, and just there was the car. So there was no car accident. His car was there. I thought, well, okay, that's weird. His car were was the si Were the signs of the physical altercation, uh, did they become apparent to you when you looked around yes, the garage? Yes, I mean, at first I saw the car and I thought, well, okay. He's not a bloody, mangled mess on the side of the road. He's not been in a car accident. But he's not anywhere in the house. Where is he, you know? I mean, strange. And I glanced over and I was like, what? I did the double take at this mess over where we have, like, we store stuff, you know, the more storage area instead of where the cars are. And it's like... Oh my God! You know there was like stuff everywhere. I mean, just strewn. I mean, all out. Or I mean, you know, our, our garage normally does not look like that. I mean, obviously. And it was like, oh, my heart stopped again. It was like, <gasps> and I went and I, I was looking around and I saw the pin had been pushed back and I saw that the the passenger um, side of the uh, front seat, I mean, the window was rolled halfway down. It's cut where he'd eaten. You know, was still in the you know floorboard and receipt from where he'd eaten at was over there. I mean, he was like, okay, this is weird. This is he's nowhere to be found. His car's here, and but there's all this evidence of a, of a scene. Somebody and I thought somebody because we've gotten dressed, death threats and things over the years, and I thought some criminal, some 
maniac or some goon or somebody that somebody's hired or something has come along and grabbed him and they had a tussle and hauled him off and murdered him. That's what I thought. What a, I mean, what a, what a horror! To, what a horror to even contemplate. I know. I mean, I, I've never been so horrified, scared in my life, and everything. And I was like, you know, and I was. I think I may have grabbed my cell phone when I realized he wasn't around, and I had it in my hand. Maybe I was like, try, you know, trying to. Well, I think I actually had called. Roger. I called the phone that Roger had, and as it turned out, it was in the trunk along with his. So I found out later. I thought. Oh my God! You know, and then later I went down and checked to see once I realized he'd been arrested. But it was horrible to call. I was like call, trying to call somebody or take somebody. He's like, Oh my God! Something's happened to Roger. Well, how did you? Uh, uh, well, I don't think we can even I say he was that. arrested, can we? I mean, there no, was no. He wasn't. He, was an, he was abducted. I, I he was abducted. He was he was beaten severely and abducted and and, and he's in jail. But I don't consider it. You know that he was arrested. But what happened was, is I came back upstairs. I was just shaking like a leaf, and I and I proceeded to think of who to call. And I ended up calling a friend of ours, a um, uh, retired judge over in Mississippi, uh, that is, you know, a real good friend and has had his share of woes with, you know, uh, being politically persecuted and whatnot. And I called him up. It was about midnight by this time, and they were about ready to get bed. <laughs> and I was like. I called myself, oh my God, Roger, I think he's been abducted. He's been, you know, somebody's gotten him, nabbed him, and hauled him off. And, and the person said, has he, could he have been arrested? And I, and I was like, arrested? Because I didn't even say that because, I mean, it was such a scene. You don't think when somebody's arrested, you know, that there would be that kind of thing. You think, you know, because Roger's not, you know, a violent person or whatever, and that there would be that kind of thing. So, anyway, I was like, oh, my God. I said, well, I can't check because we didn't write at the moment, don't have Wi-Fi at the house. And we did, but we don't want it right now. and had it for a few weeks. But I said, gosh, I said, gosh, I don't know how to check. And he, and he said, well, hold on a minute. Let me look. I'll look online. So he was able to quickly call up the website. He said, well, here he is. And he made so and so. And I just thought, I cannot believe it. He arrested him. You know. And uh, so that's when I found out because my, you know, he was able to look up and tell me. And it says, it says uh, $500 bond from resisting arrest. Producing a rat. I thought, oh my God. And uh, so, anyway, I, I called and, you know, tried to talk with the uh, sheriff in charge of the uh, whatever, and I wasn't able to talk with Roger then. They said, well, he's not going to be able to, you know, talk. He can't, he's you not know, able to come to the phone or something. And, so um, he didn't even get his I, one I, phone call? No. Uh, I think eventually he did. Sometime well after, it was probably maybe one in the morning, and maybe he was able to call me for a few minutes or something. But no, I, I was like, I told the guy, I said, I thought he was supposed to have one phone call. Well, then what they were probably doing, I don't know if they were like waiting, if they had some ulterior or more motive to wait until after midnight. I mean, because let's think about it. He was you know, arrested. He was assaulted and beaten and hauled off like between 6 and 6.30, and he didn't actually get taken to the holding area or the or cell or whatever they call it and everything. He was some kind of other holding area uh, until after midnight. Now, what was the reason for that? Was it something to do with, like, the day that, you know, like, as far as a number of days they can keep him or something? Of course, they can do whatever they want to. Gosh, only knows how many days they might try to keep him. Hopefully, we'll get legal representation and be able to get him out. But, um, but I mean, we just wanted that's curious. I mean, what was the purpose of that? What's the purpose of anything? Uh, that they would do that. I mean, that they would hold him in some kind of area where he's not reachable. Where, uh, have you even seen him since? No, oh, I have not seen him since because, <laughs> uh, you know, I've I've basically been on self-imposed uh, house arrest. I haven't left. The, I haven't left the house, and I've just been staying. Are you in fear? Know, are, are you Are you in fear, Carol? Yes, I am. I am in fear I, that, that they will arrest me because uh, and then possibly beat me up too, or gosh knows what. I mean, but uh, the following day, on the Thursday, the 24th, uh, a sheriff deputy, I don't know if it was more than one, maybe it might have been a couple, I don't know, but I, I was uh, pounding at the door three different times during through the day, including one after dark, after 7 o'clock at night scared me to death and everything, because I kept thinking, oh, God, they're going to knock the door down or something. But they didn't, but, I mean, it just scared me, and uh, they left. 
And so I thought, you know, but I knew, I mean, something just told me, even before I talked with Roger, but, you know, Roger and I talked uh, briefly, and it's like, yeah, you need to stay put, you know, for the time being, you know, so we said, what's going on? And so I did, because I just, I just thought, well, you know, they're going to, I mean, then, like, I think the um, the next day, after I was able to get some money loaded up on his jail phone card, figured out how to do that, because, you know, I, we weren't able to call me after after that, because they needed like money on the on the account, uh, but he um, he explained, got just telling me the story of how outrageous it was the beating. I mean, I could tell it was outrageous by the physical evidence, but um, he was able to go into detail about exactly how it went down. And then you know, then even like the next day after that, like on Friday, I talked with him, and that's when I was you know he said he told me about that he didn't like say I've got a search warrant I've got an arrest warrant I've, you're under arrest and that's it. I said oh my god you're kidding me Cause that, I, mean, I knew that he'd been beaten but I thought you know, maybe they at least said you know you're under arrest and then proceeded to you know rough him up real good uh, you know they say obviously that's wrong but I mean I thought maybe at least they said something but I said oh my god it's even worse I mean it's even more bizarre than we even imagined so you, know, you, you haven't been able you haven't been able to see him Carol has anyone been able to see him? Um, let's see. I, I, we did have a lawyer go and see him on um, a couple of days ago, Monday afternoon, and and there was you know, a, that, yeah. okay. So so uh, so someone has seen him, but if I understand correctly, you say that he was charged with what obstructing or resisting arrest or something yeah they're, they're claiming uh, they're claiming resisting arrest although how you can uh, resist arrest when they never say anything about you're under arrest sure but but or, I, I just I just want to I just want to I want to work yeah. <laughs> I want to work through this real real carefully exactly. uh, he was charged he was charged uh, as far as you know with a crime resisting that arrest or obstruction of an officer arrest. or whatever it's called down there yeah it's called resisting arrest and the bond was originally set at five hundred, or you know, the you know, but mysteriously the next day suddenly it, it doubled. It became a thousand dollars. So that was uh, weird. I mean, everything about this is weird, but yeah. So that was what we were told. And, and are you are are you uh, you've you've referenced your house, your garage? Mm -hmm. You are property owners in the state of Alabama. Yes. Uh huh. Okay. Um, I'm I'm just I'm just trying to sort out. But the charge, the the underlying charge that sent the deputies to your home was allegedly a contempt citation? Yes. It was supposedly two contempt citations. I guess one for the Liberty Duke uh, person, I did, you know, that her case, you know, it was two separate suits. One from Duke against my, myself and Roger, and then one from Riley against myself and Roger. And uh, <laughs> they're, they're, they're called me. I got promoted. I didn't realize that. You called me uh, administrator of the blog. I didn't realize I was administrator of the blog. I'm not administrator of the blog. Let's be clear about <laughs> that. What, You're not. Did you yeah. say you are not administrator not. of the blog? No, I'm not administrator of the blog. I'm Roger's wife, <laughs> and Roger's the Roger's legal counsel, and he's the he blogs. He's the writer and and researcher. I mean, you know, I mean, I might help. You know, I like my videotape him if he, you know, on videotape, or we have taken a couple of road trips to get. <laughs> oh, the all famous Bill Pryor picture I went with him to go get. But I mean, as far as, you know, I don't administrate it. I mean, you know, you might say, could you, you know, proofread it? I might read it and I'd say, oh, here's a typo you need to fix. I mean, but under, that, under, that, under that, no, that, uh, right. Is that considered administrate? <laughs> That's just considered a spouse. Well, you know? at this point in time, I have, uh, I have, I have no idea, Carol, because uh, apparently the Constitution of the United States is not in force in Shelby County, Alabama. No, it is not. Hmm? Uh, let me. Uh, well, let me. Our state of Alabama. <laughs> well, that could well be. Um, let me. Uh, well, let, let's let, let me explore this just a little bit further with you, if I may. Just a couple of things uh, that you've mentioned uh, along the way. Hmm. Um, I, I, I want to make sure that we've got all of this completely in order. Hmm. Um, your husband was assaulted battered, abducted from his own home by people who are were purporting to be agents of the sheriff's office of Shelby County, Alabama, correct? Correct, correct. You have not seen him since that abduction. Mm -mm. You have spoken to him only by phone. By phone. 
He has not he been afforded no medical. No, no medical. He, I was going to say, ask that. He, he has not received any medical treatment, to the best of your knowledge, or examination he has not. for uh, the injuries he sustained in the course of the assault, the battery, and the abduction. Mm. He evidently he told me he had, you know, wounds all over him. Had you know, cuts, bruises, and abrasions all over him, and it really hurt me. Really, you know, it was really uh, hurt bad and. Um, but, um, you know, I asked him recently, I said, well, how are you doing? You know, I, I said, how are your wounds faring, you know, with no treatment? He said, well, they are, you know, healing, but these are my knees still hurt really bad, but just, you know. But does, he, not, does he have any, 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 any health issues that uh, uh, the, that the uh, Shelby County uh, authorities should take into account? Well, I mean. High know, blood he, pressure, diabetes, heart condition. No, no. He, uh, thankfully, you know, he's healthy in that regard. And, uh, you know, both, you know, take, <laughs> we've been under, you know, with this, since this legal thing started, we both, you know, or take stuff for, you know, have to, to uh, for depression and anxiety and everything, medication, to, um, to just cope with this. I mean, we didn't before. Um, do, you have any you know, in, do you have any indication one way or the other, Carol? as to whether uh, his prescription medications are being administered? Oh, no, no. Because, I mean, generally, from what I understand, I mean, like I said, this is our first uh, experience with any kind of criminal anything. I mean, we're not, you know, we don't have a criminal record, don't have any experience. But uh, that that's something that usually a family member or something will take, you know, their prescriptions and get it to the end of the jailers or whatever will. Wow, just like 13th century England. Or, uh -huh. or 10th century Paris. Exactly. But, I mean, the thing is, I can't go down there because, I mean, they'll arrest me, likely, you know. And also, do we really want any of the jailers administering, giving him pills? Huh? I mean, think about it. Think about that for a second. So, right now, uh, even, if, even if I had, like, say, a, a, a friend, family friend who's willing, like, I'll go down there and take his pills. You know, you don't have to go down there. Right, right. Do we really want, I mean, you know. Uh, no, I think, you, I think you raise a very valid point. Let me ask you a question about your current circumstances, Carol. Um, uh -huh. It is my understanding that as a result of a lot of uh, this, this journalism that your husband has been doing, that you are in rather, and, and, and with everything that's happened in the last month and in particular in the last week, you are in desperate financial circumstances. Is that correct? Yes, we are. Uh, you know, absolutely. Like so we, you know, he was cheated at a job in '08. I've been cheated in '09. Uh, it just, I don't know. It's just gone from bad to worse and everything. And tried to make it on savings and various things like that, and got a little bit of help, but not not too much. But we finally broke down, and uh, you know, we just hated, the, you know, just. I mean, you know, having our hand out and everything, but we decided, gosh, you know, about, oh, before this, you know, he was arrested, oh, I say arrested, before he was assaulted and abducted, uh, about a week or two weeks before, we decided, you know, that we needed to put the PayPal button on the blog, um, you know, just to see if we could, you know, maybe get some sort of a little bit of help with basic living expenses and whatnot. So, and uh, so. Matt Osborne has initiated a legal defense fund, uh, is that correct? Oh, okay. I, you know, I, th I think yeah. um, that's, that's good to hear because we, I think we're going to need it because uh, uh, you know all this mess has washed us out good. You know, all you know this, uh, you know, years of. But uh, one thing about being pro se, I mean, you know, we were able to like save money on lawyer fees. Of course, there's still like filing fees and other administrative type fees related to dealing with your own suits and everything. But you do save a little bit, but still, that that doesn't make up for the fact when you lose a job. He also when he, when he got you know ousted from UAB uh, over the blog, even though he you know didn't blog on the job or anything, but he that's the reason he got fired. They told him point blank that it was because of what he the blogging on Siegelman, mm -hmm. uh, even though it was on his own time. So uh, and then I was the only breadwinner. You no, know, wasn't making that much money and everything, so it was really stressful on me. But in '09, I got cheated out of my job. So since you know this has been kind of rough, you know, horribly rough, you know, trying to trying to make it and that we hadn't like our, our home I'm kind of worried about it and everything it's been over a year since we've paid our, our mortgage and um, oh god everything. 
Yeah, I know. So I was like, oh, my God, you know. I, but right now, I mean, obviously, forefront, more than important than anything else, is Roger's welfare, his health and safety, and to get out of there. I mean, you know, that's, you know, um, you know, we'll deal with that when we, <laughs> you know, like I said, we'll deal with that. I mean, um uh, I understand, but let let me ask you then: What is next? I mean, uh, is there a hearing scheduled? Uh, uh, how 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 do you is any is anybody strategizing how to get Roger out of jail? Well, we um, uh, like I said, we did. Uh, we've got a few you know, a few lawyers we've talked with, but one in particular uh, had been contacted by several supporters and you know certain people and whatnot that. He's a constitutional lawyer here in the uh, state. Uh, does pretty much federal work, you know. All I, I think, um, but he he went, he visited with him, and and like I said, he proceeded to try to get the like I said because it was under seal. I mean, he couldn't like just like oh, well, let me check or or whatever. And he proceeded to have to call the Riley firm to get the file sent. I, I were, we were hoping that he got that in the mail today, and uh, and maybe we'll have some better idea but he is just absolutely blown away by all the unlawful and unconstitutional and just outrageous bizarre i mean you just pick a word uh things that have gone on from start to finish with this whole deal i'll ask you one question have you have you reached out to the american civil liberties union uh uh i i need i need to do that um i've got it on my list of people to contact and places to contact uh but yeah that might be worth it I, I think i did actually call i did call them uh one number and it was an automated thing and somebody can send a letter and all this and i was like oh god we don't even have like well, i don't know, we have wi-fi but here lately we haven't even we, we ran out of black ink for a printer and a printer paper and we haven't been able to afford that Roger well, was the live grade uh, about a week or so two before he got arrested and literally did have barely had enough money to get Kit Kat out of the machine. I mean, that's oh all. God! Oh, and, and let's let's make one coins. let's make one thing clear for folks: uh, the the illegal order that the judge imposed upon Roger demanded not only that he stop writing about Rob Riley's uh, alleged affair with Liberty. What was her name again? Duke. Duke. <laughs> uh, with Liberty Duke, uh, the judge also uh, commanded again illegally. As far as I'm concerned, um, yeah, I that that all posts be removed. Right, all posts. Yes. Are those Not just from henceforth, but also to go back and remove the previous posts. I you mean, know, they were there because he wanted it purged. Because, like I said, I mean, that's just not going to look good for this conservative, upstanding, God-fearing, family values Republican. Yeah, to have any kind of thing like that, although it's been picked up other places. So even if it does get removed from Roger's blog, it's out there, you know. And I know, uh, I know this story um, actually finally hit uh, one of the larger progressive blogs out there, Think Progress, at uh, mm -hmm. one o six this afternoon, twelve o six your time. So hopefully, a lot more people will know uh, will know your story, Carol. Uh, oh yeah, and, and we've been real, we're you know real encouraged by that it's been picked up by a lot of different, uh, uh, you know, venues, um, uh, and some of them, unfortunately, some of them are even you know, you know, necessarily I'm not happy with the way they portrayed Roger, but even the more conser conservative type, you know, outfits, you know, say. This is uh, unconstitutional. I mean, you can't do that. You know, you know, even if you disagree, even if they claim to disagree with, with maybe our politics or this and that, you, you know, what was done was not remotely lawful. So, but it's been played up by you know conservatives. Is I think a Birmingham News uh, picked up on it. I don't know that it was the most flattering thing. I haven't read it because, like I said, I don't have Wi-Fi. But um, and uh, oh, I don't know. There's just a, a, a variety. And Al Jazeera. I believe it. You know, he, they were picked up on it and did the story and and judicial uh, and let's see justice. What is it called? Justice and Terry Project. I yes, I just uh, I just saw a link to that from one of our listeners who is uh, who is sure. hearing your your account. 
Um, right, Peter I'm, B. Collins, of course, you know. Right, Peter B. Collins. Uh, just, a, just a number of places, and then, and we're continuing to play. More and more places are interested. It's just kind of <laughs> we're hoping this goes really viral. Well, you uh, yeah. you have you have uh, this this story just gives us a pretty good idea that a lot in Alabama, you know, for all the talk about how the Deep South has changed, a lot in Alabama has not. At this point yeah. in time, it certainly feels like Alabama is the place where justice goes to die. It does. It does, and it really, uh, you know, it's almost harder. Oh, I'm not going to say it's harder. I mean, obviously, but, you know, as far as, like, the civil rights movement and all that, as far as um, uh, African-American, you know, how they are treated and, and whatnot, uh, but, I mean, to be, like, you know, a, you know, white liberal, I mean, they hate, you know, it's like the Republicans hate us almost more, you know, hated Siegelman more, because, you know, I mean, it's like, you're what? You're supposed to be one of us. You're supposed to be conservative. What's wrong with you? Kind of thing. I mean, it's like they come down harder, almost, in this latest wave of, of thuggery. <laughs> and, you know, I mean, that's, you know, it seems to me, I mean, cause like I said, they've really come down hard on us, and it's like, it's like somebody referenced, I forget, uh, it's like, you know, it's like a crime to be a liberal in the state, you know, particularly probably if you're white. I mean, it's all that they expect, you know, I guess, you know, it's just, it's just, it's just unnerving and upsetting. And, well, I, I you uh, know, I, I'm, I'm concerned, I'm very much concerned for your own well-being, and I, uh -huh. uh, and I hope you stay, I hope you stay strong. You have to stay strong, Carol, because this is, not that I'm giving orders or anything, but no, no, you know, this ahead. is you. You now find yourself, and I'm sure you already realize it, on the absolute front lines of uh, the, str the 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 struggle for freedom in this country. Um, yeah, I and know. and you know, tell when you when you get a chance to tell Roger, tell him, uh, talk to Roger, tell him that he has uh, the support and the the best hopes of a whole lot of people behind him. And I hope that the next time we talk, and I hope we will talk again, Carol, I hope that the next time we talk, we can talk about how um, uh, the Shelby County Circuit Court, Rob Riley, his daddy, and, and uh, Liberty Duke, and everybody, uh, the Garrison woman, um, Garrison woman. And also Rose, have all you been, know. yeah, have oh, all been dragged, Rove. yeah, uh, well, because, yeah, uh, I forgot to mention, Carl Rove is, uh, his tentacles run into this at least yeah, tangentially, mm -hmm. uh, but that they have all been dragged kicking and screaming uh, to uh, uh, to the to, to something resembling justice. Carol, I wish you well, and I'll remind folks now that uh, a legal defense fund has been set up for uh, Roger Schuler over at OsborneInc dot mm -hmm. and uh, and and that that will go to help. In uh, in the effort to obtain justice for We're hoping for Roger, somebody pro bono. I think there's you know definitely uh, should be you know uh, well like I said the guy that uh, talked with him Monday. Uh, I think would be we might be willing to do it pro bono at least the initial part. So I'm hoping you know that maybe we will incur as many expenses. But I mean, gosh knows you you know that uh, you never know when you get involved with that kind of stuff. So yeah, it definitely helps to you know have to have a legal defense fund and also the the paypal button on the uh, blog for any sort of other right experience. and anybody searching for legal schnauzer can find that there yeah legal schnauzer uh, dot blogs dot dot com but yeah we appreciate everyone's support and any help that anybody can lend and appreciate you having me on and uh, well it's an honor anybody 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 standing up for justice and standing up for integrity and standing up for the rights of free speech and 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 a free real media uh, within this country has has my admiration. Carol, I wish you well. Oh, thank you. And again, thank our you. our fondest and best regards to Roger, please. I, I will tell him, and I thank you so much, Bob, for having me on. It's been an honor. Thank, Take care. Thank you. Bye uh -huh. now. Carol Schuler, wife of Roger Schuler, who is at this moment imprisoned in Alabamistan, on uh, having been having been assaulted, battered, abducted, 
and dragged off, uh, uh, dragged off to incarceration on nothing more than the whim of a circuit judge with no more sense of the proprieties and actual legal precedents surrounding the First Amendment gar uh, the First Amendment guarantees of freedom of the press in this country than a hog knows about Sunday haberdashery. This is a not disturbing item. This is a terrifying item. In many ways you can see this account as the nightmare portrait of where the right wing and the Republican Party seek to take this country. You've heard Dr. Bill talk in the last week about how there really is, a, and, and I've talked about it too, how there really is a plan in this country to do away with the forms of government which we perhaps have taken for granted. Alabamistan and its little petty dictators, its abusers of the law, its pettifoggers, are a laboratory for all of that. Again, uh, Roger Schuler's Legal Defense Fund um, is, is soliciting uh, contributions over at osborneinc.com. You can also find uh, a link to that at uh, Matt's Twitter feed, Osborne Inc. On Twitter, the hashtag is op, O-P, Schuler, S-H-U-L-E-R. 